it seemed to me in a certain sense that in our first meeting we kind of uh, talked about the past a bit so you you told me a bit of your story and and we talked about how power future came to be and the different devices you use how I, I, I kind of like try to got, get them all on the second we more and more in the present so we were talking about this device and having like a conversation and I kind of got here a little better but r right now I wanted to talk about future then you know so I've got three questions about the future and the first one is uh, and in a certain sense about death as well because uh, I, if I am here I have been called in a, cert in a certain sense by death If you hadn't said to me that you got sick and that there was like this uh, unknown life expectancy, I wouldn't have had the, the urgency to come as fast as I did. So this is something that draws me here. So the first question, which could be really quick, is uh, talking about future. So what do you expect like from death? Do you expect anything? Like, what do you feel about this? I don't know what death is, mm -hmm. so I have no expectations. Okay. Um, I expect um, to die as I have lived. <clears throat> My experience um, of living uh, has been uh, a kind of dedication to the present time. I'm not really um, past oriented. I'm sometimes some future oriented, but primarily I'm a like being in the, in the present moment. Um, this is what helps me stay in a creative state for me to do what I do, whether it's writing <clears throat> or making a film or playing music. It all happens in the present moment. It's the only place where I feel that life happens. Uh, and so until that moment where I stop breathing, I don't know what's, what's going to happen next. You know, I live with uh, uncertainty, a state of uncertainty to me. Um, is synonymous well, with a creative state. Uh, when I don't know what's going to happen next, I'm excited. I'm not anxious. It's more like, okay, let's, let's go, let's do this. Um, so, um, I don't, so, I don't really have anything to say about, about death. I don't like pain, you know, I don't like, you know, agony and torment, so, um, you know, given that my condition may move into, um, you know, more difficult uh, sensations. Um, I have uh, faith that I'll also be taken care of. Um, there's, uh, there's medicines. Um, I'm actually looking forward to the opium a little bit, mm -hmm. or morphine, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I've never done this one. This one. It's one of the few I haven't done in my life, you know. <laughs> well, it's interesting. There was a time um, <clears throat> I lived in... Um, uh, Port Town Center, it's a little seaside village up on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. I was up there for about a year and a half. And it turns out that the um, um, opium poppy grows wild there. And it grew in my backyard and I was uh, kind of wondering, well, what, 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 I wonder what this is like. So I did some research and I learned how to cultivate the, um, the serum or the sap from the opium. I smoked it. Um, I wasn't doing anything else at the time. I was, I was kind of in a transitional time in my life. And I thought, why not smoke some opium and <clears throat> see what happens. And, and I, it was really kind of great, very relaxing and kind of dreamy and soothing. And then about a month into it, um, I felt that I was um, coming down with a bad cold or some kind of bad flu. And I realized at that moment I had become addicted to opium. Well because that was the first sign of my brain um, reacting to not having enough opium because the brain produces the, the identical or mirror chemical um, endorphins mm -hmm. and once you start smoking opium or taking you know heroin or morphine or any of that 
um, the endorphin levels go down. The brain, the brain says, ah, you're already giving me, you know, similar chemical compounds, so I'm not going to produce any endorphins. So what happens when I'm not, I, I went a few days without smoking, and I felt like, oh my God, life is hell. <laughs> because the brain's natural pleasure chemicals were not producing, and I was just experiencing the harsh directness of existence. <laughs> yeah. and, and I realized, okay, this is, this is time, this is kicking time. Yeah. I, di I didn't want to keep smoking the opium, I realized I had a choice. You keep smoking the opium and keep feeding the brain the chemicals that it wants to generate, or you stop for a few days and you suffer some as the brain generates and kicks back into action and the endorphins came back. and. Uh, you know, happily ever after. Okay, so you've got a, like a, a you you've got a sneak peek. You know, you you know you know it's going to be like in a, in a certain sense. Yeah, yeah. I knew you know I knew I was um, courting addiction. You know. No, I mean right now. I mean right now. Like you you you, you have something to look forward to. Like you know what this the, this feeling is, this dreaminess of the opioids. So you've been you've been there before. This is. Also, yeah. yeah. Yes, okay. I have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that's you know. And yeah, again, um, uh, another thing about, I have ideas about death, um, but I have no certainty at all, mm -hmm. no, no clue, and I like it like that. Um, to me, I have come to uh, believe, you know, uh, in my own kind of way of seeing things, uh, death as a transition, mm -hmm. um, not as a finale, mm -hmm. not some like final, you know, ending. And I think earlier on I was talking about an out-of-body experience yes. that I had. Mm -hmm. And that pretty much cured me of um, this any kind of um, delusion that thinking my physical body was the only part of me. Mm -hmm. And so I know now the physical body dies, but I'm not sure that the soul does. It's been my experience in my most soulful experiences of having um, consciousness touch uh, uh, infinity. Yes. To be seen, right? To be seen. Yeah. 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 No, I've had too many um, expansive experiences um, where my consciousness reaches a continuity, mm -hmm. meaning it's not broken. Mm -hmm. I have a good long attention span. I've been training my attention to write books. To write a book, you have to have a long attention span. Mm -hmm. You have to know where things are as mm -hmm. you go. Same with writing screenplays. You have to have good attention. Um, and so that has stretched my attention span, mm -hmm. and it stretches to a certain point. And I don't know when that point is. It's unpredictable. But every time when I hit it, my attention just zooms forever. It just, I just like, I'm seeing forever. Mm -hmm. So it's just an experience of the infinite as not a concept, but as a, uh, as a phenomena and of, um, in a sense, experiencing myself as an inf infinite being. Mm -hmm. and that's not saying that, oh, I'm going to live forever. I'm not, you know, it's not about um, immortality or anything like that. Um, it's more simply a subjective experience of um, uh, a very expanded state of, of mind. Okay. Okay. That's good enough. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is uh, this is the first thing. The second thing is about your technique and uh, the work you've created as an artist. It's gonna be there. It's in the inter it's in the internet. That the DVDs can be bought, the books can be bought. But you've created a technique which is uh, which is a li living thing in a certain sense. You know, like as I as I I appropriated it into myself. I don't know if this word is the same in English and Portuguese, but uh, it's become something of mine, but at the same time it is it is still that thing which you created. So it will live through you. You will die and this thing will still be here. Uh, do you think that as it is, your parafuture technique, do you think that it grows? Do you have any idea what will happen with it? Do you have any uh, foreseeable uh, insight or anything about the future of what you have created? Absolutely not. Um, there's no way to... My favorite way of predicting the future is to create 
in the future. And if I'm not around, I'm not creating the future in terms of, you know, bear theater or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> State of, State of Emergence, um, my book on um, experiments in um, group ritual dynamics, is probably the book that most closely codifies the techniques through a series of um, chapters that uh, outline and structure uh, the basic principles and methods, and then provide uh, five different rituals at various degrees of difficulty uh, all the way through. Uh, for anybody who wants to um, uh, read the book and begin applying it, that is pretty much the only way you're going to discover this is something that you can actually do. I say that because uh, the work is, from my experience of doing it for over 40 years with hundreds of people, it's not for everybody. You know, it's very common, you know, that a, let's say a group of 10 will meet and after two or three sessions of about a 12 session, you know, block of time, uh, and each session is about three hours, um, maybe three or four people will drop out. They just don't understand it, or it's too difficult, or sometimes the physical exercise is too invigorating, or they simply have a problem with the asocial you know, part of it. They, they were expecting to become friends with the people there, or hook into some kind of community, or maybe find some kind of sexy partner there who does a ritual with them or something like that. <laughs> and none of that is going to be really provided as long as the work um, begins from an asocial premise, which is really the only way in which this work can provide uh, effective um, and valuable results. Um, if um, you can somehow bypass the social considerations and the social talking before each session and enter silently and just enter into the physical warm-up and just continue in silence really throughout the three hours and maybe at the end of every session we form a group circle and we talk about what happened. Uh, but even then there's a certain um, structure of how to talk about this work um, and it's very simple but not um, easy. And what makes it simple is that uh, uh, the, the intention in that group circle is simply to um, to voice, to give voice to what happened, not to what it meant or what you thought it meant, and especially not to go into a kind of um, philosophical or humanitarian idealism about what it all means. And you know, see that what that would do is it takes you away from the present time and takes you away from your actual experience. But if you can simply say what's reported as honestly and clearly as possible. It begins an integration process that I think is quite important. And that integration process has to do with um, the fact that the work itself, when you're engaged in the process of pair theater, um, you come into a, a kind of um, intuitive depth experience, a sensory, somatic, visceral, um, physical and vocal experience, but it's primarily um, nonverbal and there's no language, you don't speak. And so the intellect and the intellectual rational function is relaxed, suspended and put, put aside for a while. So it's three hours where the intellect and the rational mind has to endure not being the boss. <laughs> you know, it has to figure out, how do I get through this without thinking? <laughs> and, and, and yet that's what has to be somehow accomplished that somehow you have to find a way to bypass the thinking machine and enter into an awareness that is more uh, attuned to the presence and energies that's coming through your body and giving them expression. So by the end of the group circle you have you provide the your intellectual and rational mind some opportunity to catch up. Say okay report what happened and the mind will say, yes, I'll, I know what happened, I'll tell you what happened, but then it can go overboard and say, well, I think it mm -hmm. means this, and don't you think it means that? And, so, and then all of a sudden you start, uh, what's the word, uh, putting a lid on the experience, mm -hmm. and then you get farther away from the experience. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not for everybody. Um, and uh, But so just, just so I can get a bit back, uh, are there uh, are there more people you relate to that report using the, this technology? Uh, is it like a, is it in movement or how do you feel this? Just well, there's 
many many techniques, both internal adjustments and external adjustments. I Meaning there's, there's an inner dimension of techniques and an outer dimension of mm -hmm. techniques. However, the techniques ultimately are not the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, the techniques are there primarily to um, uh, create in the beginning a kind of structure and a context and a direction. But eventually, once the techniques are absorbed, um, you can relax them and move towards uh, a simple instinctive and perhaps intuitive way of moving through the work. And it's a little bit like learning, um, you know, any art form that requires techniques, like, you know, music, you're learning, if you're a violinist and you learn a Bach uh, partita, and you have to learn, you have to have a specific technique and ability to play that, to read the music and to play each note right and to play it well, and you do it enough times and then you, the technique is, you throw it away and you just play it. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little bit like that in the paratheta process. So once you learn the techniques, you don't have to depend on them so much. They've just simply become part of your experience. And it's actually where um, I think the most important part of the process happens, and that's you get to play. There's a heightened sense of play, mm -hmm. the spirit of play. It's not all so serious. And so, you know, morose, like, oh, we're going to do some big ritual here. It's going to be so fucking meaningful. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm going to handle it. <laughs> you know, yeah. because that happens too. You know, people come out, you know, crying sometimes or laughing hysterically mm -hmm. because they have exposed some part of themselves that they didn't, never knew existed. Mm -hmm. And so this is a process of genuine self-discovery of entering unknowns and discovering um, what you don't know about yourself. And sometimes that can be a little shocking um, if it's embarrassing, you know, something that uh, you don't want anyone to see. Mm -hmm. And there you are, you're embodying it. <laughs> you're a big, a big fool of yourself. Mm -hmm. And you're wondering, oh, who's looking, you know. <laughs> and then there's the self-consciousness, you know. People sometimes are very self-conscious. They want to know, oh, how does this look? Am I, am I looking bad? Or what's that person thinking of me now? So all that has to somehow be pushed aside. So how do you get over yourself? And there are methods here in the, in the work um, to help uh, support uh, that important first task of getting over yourself. Mm -hmm. Get your attention off yourself. And the first task is get your attention off yourself and put it on the space of the workspace. Not the things, not the chairs, not the lamps, not even the people the space between people. Get your attention, put it on the space, and then find a way to move through that space and relate physically to the space itself as you move moment to moment. And this begins a process of spatial awareness and a fluidity in your relation to space so that there is an awareness of space as you move. And when you do that, there's also be cultivating a respect for the space around people. Everyone has their own personal space. Mm -hmm. And people feel, when you are respecting their space, they feel that, you know, they sense that. And so this is part of the begin, very beginning process is um, cultivating a respect for space, spatial awareness. And that's actually that ignites, that starts the asocial process mm -hmm. that I'm talking about. Okay. So I get that in a certain sense, it's, more, no, it's, it's how people have been touched to kind of answer what, I'm, I'm, what I was searching. It's more like how people have been touched and changed by this technique than about this technique being alive per se, right? I mean, like the... how has... because I get, I get what, you, what you're talking about, like nowadays I have... Uh, it's been 18 years since I started working with the technique and 18 years is a lot, it's a long time already, like it's half my life, you know, I'm 36. So nowadays I feel like I can go into, I, I'm, I'm mostly receptive, like unless we are on one of the, those days, you know, when, when we're like super stressed and a lot of my heads, our heads and stuff, but apart from that, like I've, I've become more receptive, more silent and more creative as well. Uh, And I think this technique has been a lot of it, but 
in my personal practice I've, I have kind of dropped it like or at least the formality of it like uh, I've always like reading the book there's there's this specific uh, ritual in towards an archaeology of the soul uh, which is the virus uh, dialogue and I've always wondered like have you done like this a lot like have you been sick and done the, the virus dialogue but I've got to a point right now in which I don't need necessarily to go through like the whole stages of a ritual I can just go to my like my my room, my workspace I have, and I just stop for about 20 minutes, and I, I've, I'm already like accessing my body and going into into receptivity, and into this place where I can like gather information about myself more easily. So what I feel like like talking about future and using myself as an example is that maybe it's not only about like the the, the hard techniques of the work, but how has this work instrumentalized people? Uh, and the people you've touched with this work to be in attunement with themselves and in presence more. I think this is more of the. F I feel like this is more of the future than the work in itself. You know. Yeah. The um, individuals that have stayed with the work for um, more than um, three labs, let's say. Uh, a lab will be about anywhere from two to three months, meeting anywhere from one to three times a week. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, it, it just takes two labs, but for the most part three. Anybody that's gone through at least three labs uh, typically have reported um, a kind of a radical uh, change of life. They, they say it's, this is a life-changing experience, um, I will never be the same kind of report. Mm -hmm. And I can understand that very clearly. Um, my life has certainly not just changed, but you know, after um, participating in countless labs, not just facilitating, but doing the work for over 40 years, 42 years, um, I have been imprinted with the no form in a very strong way. No form is the, kind of the crux method or non-method, but it's, it's, it's a trigger for deep receptivity, a um, standing position. So anyway, having gone through the no-form process so many times over four decades, um, right now in my current stage of uh, living with lymphoma, um, I have no fear of death as a transition. To me, death is probably closer to no-form. Mm -hmm. And no form is, is the start of creation, not the end. Mm -hmm. um, out of no form, there is the receptivity through which all images, all music, all life, all directions come through and form that. So I live like that. And so the um, experiences that I've integrated and taken in through all the different sources and methods that I've gone through, um, they're deeply embedded in my muscles and my cells. So it does not, it takes just a couple seconds for me to enter in a particular place. If I give that signal, I say, okay, this is where I want to go. And then I'm there. And entro is gone and there's something else inhabiting. So um, that's, that's coming from long-term practice in this work. Um, in regards to other individuals who report to me, it's always very different because each individual comes to the work from very different background that has shaped their nervous systems in very different ways. And with different necessities as well, I imagine. So what? And with different necessities as well? Yeah, different needs. needs different. Yeah. The people have different reasons for doing the work, different mm -hmm. motivations. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, probably the most common motivation at the very beginning um, for many is um, they get a taste of of the um, of, a, of a kind of ecstatic experience mm -hmm. and so they find out that they can get high doing this work mm -hmm. some kind of high like a drug mm -hmm. yeah but I had a, a student who had said this in the last lab she was like when I when I got home like the second day I went to my boyfriend and I said oh it's like getting high but with no drugs I was like really really high yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> it, it's like that and so a lot of people just keep coming back to the work to get more high <laughs> now this it's it's really funny because 
uh, this will work for about maybe five or six sessions, mm -hmm. not labs. Mm -hmm. And around session number five or six or seven, the, um, the motivation for getting high starts to weaken. Mm -hmm. um, there's a boredom thing that happens around mm -hmm. s session five or six uh, quite often um, where things are not as intense as they were in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Things were not as high as they were in the last session. Mm -hmm. And so there's this frustration. Yeah, they need a stronger drug. <laughs> I need a stronger drug, stronger no form, stronger <laughs> force or whatever. Yeah. and. Uh, and at that point, we, there's a discussion I have to bring up that, uh, you know, that this is a common transition of um, pursuing uh, rapture, ecstasy, pleasure as a goal unto itself. Like that's the reason you're doing anything. Um, it's great, but uh, it's um, short term. It doesn't have as much fuel, mm -hmm. not as much gas in the tank, mm -hmm. or it's very low, low grade fuel compared to uh, other motivations. So then I introduce other reasons. Um, for um, doing the work that are uh, more challenging, but in the long run, uh, more rewarding and more long lasting, uh, lasting value motivations, such as um, uh, working on um, uh, the shadow archetype you know, within oneself so that one can recognize um, the unconscious projection of our hates and fears onto the world, onto others, or even onto ourselves and expose those to yourself so that you can begin claiming and becoming accountable and responsible for your own projections. And as a result, come into a, really a greater sense of freedom. And so here, freedom then becomes a much, I think, higher motivation or it has a more lasting value as a motive to achieve a level of true freedom, especially living in a society that uh, may become increasingly politically um, oppressive and socially restrictive and so forth. So freedom is in high demand, mm -hmm. real freedom, true, true freedom, not, not just freedom like the consumerist kind mm -hmm. of freedom where you could, I can do anything I want because I've got the money and I can buy it and then that's not the freedom I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. That's also a frustration freedom mm -hmm. eventually. You know, getting your way too much um, it, it's frustrating. Um, no, I'm talking about the true freedom and which is um, an inner freedom that can begin, you know, as you become more accountable, um, you know, for some of the um, the dirt that you're throwing out at the world, or the bad attitudes that you have, or the, you know, the negative um, uh, energy you're throwing at people, and also, um, you know, crushing your own soul with, uh, um, you know, an overwhelming inner critic, for example. Mm -hmm. um, all of these are aspects of the shadow archetype. So that becomes the next level of work. If people want to continue after getting high off the work, we go into you know shadow work. And there are other levels after that too that go beyond um, shadow work. But um, as as uh, we outgrow different stages of the work, we have to challenge ourselves and go even further. And that there are ways to do that. It's all in the book. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this takes me to the my my third question which uh, you might not like so much because I, I, I'm getting to know you a little, better, a little bit better so you answer me as you want. Uh, so we've talked about like what, what, you f you, what you expect of death in a certain sense, which is nothing, which is a great expectation actually. Uh, then we, we, we talked a bit about how could this go through after you, this para future medium. And what 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 do you think about the world, like the world we live in? Uh, how is what do you expect? Like you you can't expect anything. This is just like an exercise in imagination. But what do you see in this world now that you're living it, uh, going away? You know. Well, I've always believed that the world is the least of my problems. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the world uh, uh, is fed to us by a series of um, images uh, in the mass media, or if you're fortunate and uh, privileged enough to have the money to travel around the world, you can see firsthand and talk to people and hear their stories and, you know, you get more of a, I think, a, a real world um, experience of the world that way. But for the most part, um, uh, 
See, I, I'll put it this way. <clears throat> I distinguish between the world and the planet. Mm -hmm. They're not the same to me. Mm -hmm. uh, the planet is the, uh, represents the force of this planet, and I'm looking at the planet in an aboriginal um, perspective as a vastly compassionate, intelligent entity that has embodied as a planet. Mm -hmm. And it's a dreaming entity. Mm -hmm. And a dreaming entity that is dreaming everything into existence on the planet. Insects, animals, birds, human beings, dinosaurs. It's a process of constantly dreaming. And the Earth, as the planet, um, undergoes its own massive um, uh, evolutionary and transformational cycles that include um, cycles of extinction, you know, where you have entire species wiped off over and over again throughout its particular planetary history. Um, so the planet is, is um, full of mystery and force and power, and the planet, in my experience, the Earth is calling the shots. The Earth has always called the shots. The Earth is in charge. Um, now people, as human beings, because you know we've developed all kinds of technology and we've had um, great accomplishments, and for the most part, you know we're very clever monkeys, and we have in our <laughs> cleverness believed that we uh, are taking credit for a lot of things. Especially, we're destroying the planet. We're we have to save the planet, and I think the human beings are not destroying the planet. The planet is simply responding. I think to. Uh, different crises that it has its own way of overcoming, and the um, uh, I was going to say, um, I think you know, I think if anything needs saving, it's probably people need saving from themselves. You know, I don't think the planet needs saving. I think this planet will do just fine. Uh, I, I think I'm pretty sure the human race will become extinct before the planet becomes extinct. Yeah. You know, that's pretty much my 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 take on it. Uh, the world, I look at the world um, primarily as a tragedy. I look at the uh, tragedy of the world. And I don't see tragedy as a bad thing. I see it more in the Shakespearean sense, which sometimes um, takes a comic turn. You know, tragedy and comedy, you know, the tragic masks and the, the comic masks mm -hmm. are upside down the same mask, mm -hmm. uh, part of the same human condition. Um, we are uh, a tragic species and we are a hilarious species. We are um, uh, monkeys run amok and we are um, monkeys murdering each other. You know, <laughs> it's crazy. It's a crazy, crazy place. Um, so I like, uh, I appreciate the, um, uh, what I call the tragic insight um, in that it, um, it allows for a certain empathy and um, ability to relate to almost anybody depending on, I mean, it doesn't matter who they are, you know, what race they are, what, you know, culture they're part of, what color their skin is. Um, everyone has to die, you know, and anything that lives dies. And, um, and there's all kinds of um, influences, and this is part of the tragedy, uh, through the education systems, through faulty parental conditioning, through faulty thinking, there's all kinds of mistakes in the thinking process that um, keep people naive to the inevitability of death uh, and dying as a part of existence, as a part of life. So there's this cultivation of a great fear of death and that is then um, used by governments to control the people. Um, through you know skyrocketing insur health insurance rates and you know hospital bills that you can't afford to pay and so you have to to die early because you can't pay the bill and there's this horrible horrible things that occur um, you know in the name of um, you know commercial and um, you know monetary advancement and um, uh, uh, beyond you know helping people advance as human beings. So there's tragedy. That, that's a real tragedy, and there's. I don't know if there's any way in which that tragedy. Um, I mean, people are aware of it, the tragedies, the atrocities of existence, and there are many different organizations that are fighting it and trying to make life better, and that's really great. Um, but there's something much deeper at work, 
uh, in the um, in the human psyche as a species. And this is me generalizing because mm -hmm. I I'll just indulge. I don't like generalizing so much, but you know, just for entertainment purposes, <laughs> um, there are two to me um, fundamental um, surges in the human species, and one of them is called, I call the human genius, and the other one is the human stupidity. Species stupidity, species genius. And they are fighting neck and neck, who's gonna win, who's <laughs> gonna win? And you go through stages, eras, like centuries, where species stupidity, stupidity is on top and is pounding the genius away. And then you have maybe, you know, 30 years where the genius comes up and is pounding the stupid, the stu species stupidity away. And they're just beating each other up, they're just fighting. But they're both there. And, um, and it's dramatic. It's a theater at its best, um, uh, and they're both there simultaneously. And it, and it shows up in people in various combinations. You know, I've come to know people of, of genius myself, and they have each one of them um, uh, really stupid sides to them. <laughs> I mean, really stupid sides. Things that uh, they've done that have got grave consequences to their lives, and yet they're geniuses at the same time. You know, you can be like, for example, an intellectual genius and be a total emotional idiot, you know, or um, a social idiot, and you can have a, a physical genius as a dancer and a mover, like a, like a you know, um, Right, yeah, it's like a, a Barishkanov or, you know, mm -hmm. a Martha Graham, the genius of the body, genius of movement and so forth. Uh, but socially, they're um, uh, inept. Mm -hmm. <laughs> social idiot. I have been a social idiot most of my life, and I have to really <laughs> learn how to increase my social intelligence, which basically meant I, I had to learn how to get along with a, a greater diversity of people. Mm -hmm. Because I was, you know, was born and raised in kind of a white neighborhood, suburban, uh, in um, Toronto and also in LA. And I come out in the real world and it's like, oh my God, people are looking different than the way I, I was remembering them <laughs> as a child, you know. And it was just like a huge adventure and it was kind of great, but you know, it, it's that kind of thing. Um, it kept me socially um, um, stupid to... Um, uh, become uh, overly sheltered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we got two. We got the three. That was a great response, actually. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, okay. So this one uh, might be a bit corny, but anyway, that's my my last take, my last try. So you talk about Ruka. She said Ruka? Ruka, the, 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 the poet? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the poet wrote uh, letters for a young poet, right? Uh, yes. And since uh, we are here and you are right now the old poet, uh, because this is a state as well, it's not like something you are definitely, you know, like you're going through that phase. Yeah, I'm an old man. Yeah, but you're a poet as well. You know? I'm a poet as well, I'm yeah. an old poet. So you're the old poet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And right now I'm not so young poet anymore. I'm young, but you know, like my 20s are gone right now, but still young. You know? You're young. So, uh, so I, what I would ask of you is uh, in like very brief and not well thought way, uh, could you write, could you say something to the young poets? Not just for me, but for anyone who might be hearing and would resonate with your work and... Well, Going on the book, Letters to a Young Poet, uh, uh, Rilke, Rainer Maria Rilke, mm -hmm. um, turn of the uh, 20th century poet, um, he was responding to specific questions. Mm -hmm. So, is there a question you have, young poet? <laughs> how, to, how to remain creative, that is my... my... How to remain creative. Okay. Um, learn to live without a self-image. Um, find ways to stay receptive. There are several ways to do that, um, that I know of. One of them is to begin recognizing 
all preconceptions as lies of the mind, anytime you have a preconception about how things are going to turn out, or what this person is going to be about, or what the situation or experience is going to give you, throw it away. Because it will stop you from experiencing what's coming your way. And it's the only way you're going to discover what it is. None of the preconceptions will tell you. It'll tell you based on past experience and memory, has nothing to do with the present. So preconceptions are the lies of the mind. Uh, the next thing is to, um, and this will also help bring about a receptivity, the kind of receptivity that allows for a more direct perception. That's what I'm talking about. That's to me where creativity begins. It's in that kind of a direct, vulnerable, open state. Um, assumptions. So to assume is to make an ass out of you and me. <laughs> ass, you, me, the word. Okay? <laughs> That's a nice word, please. <laughs> yeah. To assume is to make an ass out of you and me. And the same thing, similar with preconceptions. If you have an assumption, no, I, I, then what it does is it stops you from asking questions. Once you have an assumption about something, it convinces your mind you already know what's going on. I'm assuming that or that or whatever. And so the questioning is an opening process. Statements are not opening. Statements are I'm closing. I'm making a statement. This is where I am. This is who I am. You know, don't bother me. I'm asleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am uh, in love with questions. And I'm especially in love with questions I, I can't have the answer for because once I hit a question I don't have the answer for, I put my mind at rest because I, I like my mind and I don't want my um, mind to become twisted into a knot because I can't answer some really big question because some of the big questions, either they don't have answers or the answers are really tricky. Mm -hmm. So what I do is, I, okay, I'm not going to try to answer that. The question is too big. I'm going to put it in my heart. And the big questions, they inflame my heart. My heart is on fire with big questions. The uncertainty, I don't know. There is no answer, but the heart has its own answer, and it's a flame response to the question. It's, it's responding to the question that there is no answer. And there's a longing that starts to occur. The heart longs to know, but not in the same way that the mind wants to know. The heart wants to know the experience of the question. So every question has an experience, if you can bring it into the heart. Um, the questions that the mind can answer, they're not so much experiences, but the understanding. You know, you, you answer a question correctly, ah, I understand now. Mm -hmm. And understanding is important, but again, um, it's, it's one step removed from realization. So it, when something is fully realized, to me it's really uh, embodied through the heart, through the whole self, you're realizing something, not just understanding it. So understanding can be overrated. You may somehow think, well, because I understand so much, um, that's enough. And for some people it is, just to be able to comprehend something. But it is facing and witnessing the incomprehensible of not having a clue. You're seeing something, you feel it, you're faced with it, you don't know what it is. It's bigger than your categories. You don't have a name for it, you don't have an image for it, and yet there it is staring at you. What the fuck? <laughs> right? So you have to accept on some level either, okay, some things are genuinely mysterious to me. I don't have the means to categorize it. Oh, maybe I should just call it a paradox. Oh, no, nope, that's just another word. I put that on there. Like, you know, pin the donkey, mm -hmm. you know? So can you sit with mystery? Can you sit with uh, not knowing? Um, that starts a creative state. That was perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think that's it, right? Well, I'm going to check to see what we got.